The boat pitched lightly in the surf as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting a radiant gold glow on the water. Our trip so far had been uneventful and ultimately frustrating. We set out with our fishing guide, Matt, early in the morning for a full day of fishing around the gulf and the intercoastal waters, but the surf had been quite choppy early on, and so we were confined to the coastline for most of the day, catching maybe one or two small snook in the mangroves, but not landing any of them. Not exactly what we had been hoping for our trip, and so, in our last hours of sunlight, we decided that, as the surf had gone down enough, we would go out into open ocean and try the fishing hole we had been hoping to reach that morning. It was located over a wreck and it almost guaranteed some hits from Amberjack or some red grouper, even in the late evening. So there we were, my buddy Steve and I as well as our captain Matt, straining to see in the dim light and sinking our baits down to the wreck, hoping to get some last minute action. The boat creaked quietly, straining against the anchor as a light, chilling breeze glazed across the surface of the water. Everything was churning softly and the boat rose and fell in rhythmic motions, but there was not so much as a nibble on our baits. The sun fell into the black water and was extinguished, darkness surrounding the boat on every side. All right, Matt said, we've been out here too long. We should have gone in before it got dark. Sorry about the lack of action, guys. Nah, it's all right, I said, it was fun anyway. Yeah, Steve chimed in. Thanks, Matt. Just as Matt was getting ready to pull the anchor up and we were reeling in our baits, however, Steve got a massive hit and he excitedly started reeling, shouting, Fish on! We all stopped and watched him struggle to pull the thing up from the deep water. By the way it was fighting, Matt seemed to think that it was a grouper. But that's when it happened. Everything stopped. The waves rocking the boat fanned out like a sheet being spread and lay absolutely still, the ocean becoming a glass-like mirror, flat as a lake. The wind gusts ceased and Steve cursed loudly, yelling that his fish had gotten off. The boat still rocked, but only if we shifted our weight, sending small ripples out into the eerily smooth blackness. The water perfectly reflected the dull gray clouds above us and the moon, obstructed by haze. It casted an eerie gray glow over everything, as if bleaching out any colors from the world. Steve sighed loudly and continued reeling in, only to become confused. He lifted the rod up and down, mumbling to himself quietly. It's weird, he slowly stated. This feels really heavy, like the fish is maybe still on, but it's not fighting at all, you know? We all looked at each other strangely and then glanced out into our surroundings, growing uneasy. Just... just pull it up so we can go, okay man? I said, doing a bad job to try and hide my nervousness. He agreed and reeled faster. He finally got it to the boat and we all gazed over the side, looking at it just under the surface dimly lit by Matt's flashlight. It was a good 20 inch grouper just like how Matt had predicted, but it wasn't moving. Matt lifted it out of the water to take the hook out and confirmed that it was dead. I guess sometimes a rapid change in pressure can kill him, Matt said curiously, clearly feeling a little off. He dropped the body back into the water and it began to sink like a rock to the bottom, disappearing into the bleakness as it dropped. That definitely wasn't supposed to happen. And that's when we heard it, incredibly distant, having carried for some time to reach us. Maybe it was just me being paranoid due to the strange circumstances, but it sounded like screaming. The haunting cries so faint and distant that I was unsure if I had really heard anything, and I pretended like I hadn't to make myself feel better more than anything. I casually glanced into the bait well to see all of our bait fish lying dead at the bottom. Every single one. Extremely anxious now, we helped Matt pull the anchor into the boat and hurriedly motioned for him to start the engine. He pressed the button and the engine sputtered to life, a mass of dark bubbles erupting to the surface as the propeller started up. 
The bubbles slowly dissipated as Matt prepared to shift the boat into gear, sending more obstructive ripples into the flat, reflective plane around us. Matt slowly applied the gas and the propeller churned loudly, spitting water out our back as the front of the boat lurched upwards and a wake formed behind us. But we weren't moving. Or maybe we were. It was so incredibly hard to tell with the water being a flat, reflective sheet. There was nothing on the horizon and therefore nothing to gauge if we were actually going anywhere or not. We should have been able to feel wind, but there was nothing, and although our wake seemed to flow behind us, I was somehow convinced that we weren't moving forward. As we kept our engine running, however, I slowly became more and more distressed about the waves we were making. They seemed so incredibly out of place in this world, as if we were ruining something, and I was becoming certain that something would get angry about that. Something would find us, thanks to our disturbance. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore, and I shouted, Turn off the damn engine! Matt instantly agreed, and after I looked at Matt and Steve, I could tell that they had both been thinking exactly what I had been. Something was very wrong. We sat on the still ocean once again. Our ripples slowly faded away and journeyed off into the oppressive darkness surrounding us. It made me even more distressed when I noticed that the ripples didn't seem to fade away or lessen in intensity as they sped off into the night. No, it seemed as if they would carry on forever. I mentioned this to Steve and Matt and they grew even more sickly, their faces draining of color. The night crept on agonizingly slowly as we stood rigidly, trying not to rock the boat and create more ripples. Our hearts thumped in our chests and my sense of dread was growing with every light slap of the boat against the water. Although no one admitted it, we had been hearing those screams every minute or so, distant and haunting, yet growing closer. I had denied it over and over to myself, but it was becoming harder and harder to pretend like each time. They weren't just a little more clear, a little less distant, a little louder. I don't know how long we had been sitting in that state of gruesome anticipation, but I wish it had lasted just a little longer because when something suddenly bumped against our boat and we all casually glanced over the side to look at it, my stomach churned and I nearly fainted in horror. The thing that had drifted into our boat slowly and lightly tapped it was a human corpse. The body of a child, pale and lifeless, floating in the blackened slag, in tattered clothes, gray and lying face down. Its limbs didn't even float, but rather draped down into the darkness. Its back was the only thing keeping it afloat, just barely bobbing on the surface, but although it oscillated up and down slightly, I noticed that it didn't create any ripples. Steve suggested that we try and shove it downwards to get it to sink, but I told him I didn't think that was a good idea. Nobody even wanted to look at it, let alone touch it and who knew what would have happened if we had pushed it underwater. We all just tried not to look at it, but it was so hard to not occasionally steal glances at the bobbing corpse that had so strangely found our boat. The thought made me shiver and eventually Matt spoke up saying, I think we should try the engine again. I know it may be a problem and I'm not even sure if we got any closer to shore the last time, but we have to try something. I'm sick of just sitting here. No sooner did he finish his sentence than another bout of screams came from out of the darkness. Much closer this time. Close enough that I could clearly hear that the screams belonged to children. That was much closer this time, I said aloud, nervously staring into the blackness. It almost seems like they're coming faster now. Shut the hell up, Steve cried. Just shut up. Matt, I agree. Get that engine started. We have to get out of here. Matt went to start when I interjected, saying, No, I only think they're coming faster because they know where we are, 
and the only reason they know that is because of the ripples we're making. We can't afford to make the same mistake again. Another light bump rocked the boat, and I didn't even need to look down to know that it was another corpse, the child lying face down, this time a little girl, her tattered white dress trailing down to the dark abyss under the water. If that's true, Matt said, trying to shake off the image of the new, drowned body. If that's true, then they already know where we are, and just sitting here is going to get us killed just as fast. I had no rebuttal to say to that, but I still somehow knew in my gut that starting the engine was the last thing we should have done. Despite this, however, it was two against one, and the engine roared to life, casting hideous waves into the darkness, the only movement visible for what looked like eternity. Matt punched the gas, but this time the truth was all too apparent. The two corpses floating alongside our boat didn't fall behind us or move at all. It was clear that we weren't moving. We never had been. Upon realizing this, Matt immediately shut off the engine, and I winced as the propellers spun to a stop and released a massive bubble of sluggish water to the surface where it exploded and sent ripples through the infinite slag around us. Another body almost instantly lightly tapped against our boat. But as I looked at it, my breath caught in a horror and my blood froze. It was staring upwards. Unlike the others, it was lying on its back, its hideously mutilated face gazing upwards with its hollow, white eyes. I looked around and staggered backwards as I saw that the other bodies were facing upwards now as well. Their mouths were all hideously agape, filled with black sea water, their ghastly limbs still being pulled into the darkness below them but refusing to sink. My ultimate realization came when it occurred to me that this meant that at some point, the first two bodies had spun around. As I realized this, another body lightly hit the side of our boat, almost immediately followed by another. In fact, as I looked out into the darkness, I could see countless gray smudges dotting the black, unmoving wasteland. So many corpses. They weren't all kids, but the ones that were far away all had their heads tilted towards the boat. More screams suddenly rang out from the darkness, horrifyingly close now, seemingly right over my shoulder. I whirled around but didn't see anything aside from a few bodies slowly drifting closer, and certainly not enough to have accounted for all of the screams. But that's when it happened. A massive shadow slowly swooshed under the boat, big enough that I could feel the whole sea underneath us heave slightly as it rushed past. For the first time in a long time, we rocked slightly as light waves lapped against our boat. My breath caught and I felt faint, falling to the floor of the boat for support. We were going to die, right here, right now. I hadn't really been able to see what the thing had looked like, but I knew it was massive, and it looked like it had gotten tangled in seaweed or something. Its whole silhouetted body was rippling with tentacle-like appendages. Suddenly, Steve shrieked violently and slammed to the deck. He had been bracing himself against the side of the boat, nervously glancing at the bodies below him when he suddenly fell, clutching his leg as if it had been branded with a hot iron. What, Steve? I shouted, trying to run to him, but unable to find the strength. What's wrong? Steve did nothing but panic, scrambling and gripping a pole on the deck, fighting hysterically as if he was being pulled off the boat. I thought he had gone mad when I suddenly saw it. Glinting faintly in the moonlight, an impossibly thin, thread-like string was wrapped around Steve's ankle. It looked more like a spiderweb strand than anything, but I watched as it began to slice into Steve's leg as he tried to pull himself free, drawing blood, going taunt and beginning to pull him backwards off the boat. I finally found the strength to stand up as Matt simply stared at Steve, clutching his head and backpedaling past me. As I ran to Steve to try and help, I found myself glancing at the bodies all around us. 
and if I strained, I found that I could faintly see nearly invisible strands attached to them as well. The bodies were all tethered to something. I finally reached Steve and grasped his arms firmly in mine. I could see the string extending down into the water, trying to pull him down into the abyss. You're not going anywhere, I cried, trying to make him feel better. But his face showed nothing but agony, and although the thing was never able to pull him under, the string around his leg grew so tight that in one fluid motion as I watched in horror, it sliced straight through his ankle, cleaving off his foot. The string slackened instantly, and his foot smacked onto the deck, blood pumping out from his leg in jets. He fainted almost instantly from shock and blood loss, but as I turned around to get Matt to help, I only caught a final glimpse of him desperately reaching for something to hold on to as he was dragged over the edge. His screams quickly devolved to bubbles as his body disappeared into the black oblivion. I cried out after him uselessly, but immediately silenced myself as I saw something else appear from out of the darkness. A horrible creature of massive proportions, a mangled mess of teeth in its mouth, floating effortlessly across the water, what looked like gigantic wings folded into its silhouetted body. It shrieked loudly, the sound we had been hearing all along, but close enough now that it was ear-shatteringly loud. It had sounded like screaming children, but it was clearly something else entirely. Its head cocked to one side as it gazed across the water, examining the bodies floating silently. I finally understood what was going on, just as a massive winged creature made its fatal mistake. Quickly selecting a body to eat, it jabbed its head down and scooped up one of the children in its mouth. The corpse was cleaved almost in half by the thing's serrated teeth, and as the body fell to pieces in its mouth, I could suddenly see a horrible hook-like structure bursting from within the corpse. It was attached to that silk-like thread. A thread, almost like fishing line. The line suddenly yanked downwards as a creature tried to swallow the body, and the hook was driven into its throat. The creature let out a horrendous screech and its neck snapped horribly as it was dragged under the black waves. I fell to my knees as I watched the corpses surrounding the boat get dragged back under the surface, as that massive, tentacled creature that had passed under the boat earlier dove to the bottom, taking the winged creature and all of its bait with it. That's all we were to it. Bait. Bait for creatures that ate humans. In whatever world we were in, we were the bottom of the food chain. I looked to my right to see that Steve's body was no longer there, and even as I realized this, I felt something tighten around my own leg. I tried to pull, but the line had gone taunt. There was no use fighting as I was dragged into the ice-cold, blackened water. As the waveless surface passed over my head, I realized that whatever this thing was, it was already having a better fishing trip than we did.